Hi there everybody. This is our sixth unit that we're going to be moving through in AP Psychology. This is going to deal entirely with learning. How we learn, how we define learning, um, the ways in which we go about developing certain understandings of the world around us. And so that's what this unit is going to entail. Uh, right off the bat, I'm going to very much suggest that where Unit 6 is concerned, the more examples you write down that we discuss, whether it be in these video notes or in class or things like that, the better prepared you will be. Purely because one of the greatest struggles that students have had in the past where this Unit 6 content is concerned is being able to differentiate between the types of learning, classical conditioning versus operant. Uh, and that's the big one. Um, so I would really recommend that you write down as many examples that I go through with you guys as you can because those will be incredibly beneficial when it comes to your studying for Unit 6's test. So that way you can really be able to see the difference between those topics. So when we talk about a definition of learning, it's really important we understand what the term learning means. If we're spending an entire unit discussing it, then you need to know what its definition is. And a lot of times, you know, I find that kids struggle when I ask them, oh, how do you define learning? They don't know how to do it. It's such a term that has become ingrained into their understanding. They know what it means, but they struggle to be able to explain it. And since it oftentimes ends up showing up in an FRQ, to some extent on the AP exam, it's very important that we take a look at this. So learning is, as we define it within psychology, a relatively permanent change in a person or animal or organism's behavior because of experience, okay? So you have gone through something, you have come out on the other end with some level of permanent, relatively speaking, change to your behavior, and so that is learning, okay? Uh, so, you know, you think of it from the perspective of, um, Reinforcements and punishments from B.F. Skinner. Uh, you know, steal a cookie from the cookie jar when you're little, get put in the corner. Okay? One would hope that after that there would be a relatively permanent change to your behavior that you would not go and sneak to get a cookie if you were told not to do it. How we learn is also of question to psychologists. We really want to know how this happens. And what we've learned through research, pun, you know, pun intended, is that it, we learn by association, okay? So our mind, for whatever reason, it just naturally makes connections for us, okay? It draws, you know, conclusions based off of if A is this, then B is this. And it connects things for us um, as they occur in a sequential manner, basically. So Aristotle, all the way like 2,000 years ago, suggested this kind of law of association, if you will, that there is an established theory that has been tested over and over and over and over again that our mind as we go through associations and we develop connections will naturally do it for us. Then um, about I would say 200 years ago with the advent of the enlightenment this rebirth of emphasis on human behavior and the mind and reason and logic and using science to attempt to study these you get men like David Hume or John Locke that really go about reiterating this belief that we are not born with certain aspects of our behavior. We learn those associations and so we act in kind as a result of those connections. So classical conditioning is going to be the emphasis of our discussion today. Classical conditioning is one of many types of learning and associations that we can develop as we move through our lifetimes. Classical conditioning was actually a complete and total accident. The man that discovered it is named Ivan Pavlov. He is a Russian physiologist. He was studying digestive processes in dogs. And the only reason why he stumbled on classical conditioning as a psychological aspect was because his research was not going the way that he had intended it to, to go by any sense of the means. So our exposure to the concept of classical conditioning happens because of an original experiment that went awry. In classical conditioning, Learning happens when a neutral stimulus comes to bring about a response after it's paired with a stimulus that naturally brings about a response. So that's what this thing says. Let me clarify that for you in a sense that will be a little bit easier to understand. 
classical conditioning is learned association by taking a neutral stimulus. So neutral means no reaction. Stimulus is just a fancy word for thing or object, okay? So you take a neutral stimulus, something that never naturally gets a response out of you. And over time, it gets paired with another stimulus, another object or thing, that does naturally bring out a reaction from you. And we call that the unconditioned stimulus. So you pair neutral stimulus with unconditioned stimulus over time. And eventually, a learned association develops. And so reactions will happen naturally to that once prior to that point, neutral object. So let's break this down a little bit in terms of Pavlov's theories and you know, experiences within this whole concept of digestive processes with dogs. Pavlov, I cannot express this enough, he was not a psychologist. This was not set about to be a psychological experiment. It was physiological. He was looking at trying to understand the digestive processes of dogs. Eventually, he's going to win a Nobel Prize for the research that he establishes within classical conditioning. But he stumbled on this whole concept because the research he was carrying out on dogs was not going the way it was supposed to. He was starting to notice that he had been using a bell, the ringing of a bell, a fairly neutral object that never caused a dog's natural reaction other than maybe an ear perk. It was starting to find its way into influencing certain aspects of the dog's behavior because he started to notice that before the food was put into the dog's mouths, they were starting to salivate. And that's not a normal process. You don't salivate until food enters your mouth because salivation helps you to break down that food and to carry out digestive processes a little more simply. So Pavlov's experiment breaks down like this when we're looking at it in a classically conditioned context. Before conditioning food is the unconditioned stimulus. So by that we mean it is an unlearned item you respond to. That's what unconditioned stimulus means. Salivation is an unconditioned response. It's something your body does naturally as a reaction to something, okay? Specifically a UCS. So food causes an unconditioned response. Now, within this scenario, you have the ringing of the bell, the bell's tone. That's a neutral stimulus. It's something that never caused a dog to salivate before that point. It has no level of response attached to it. During conditioning, though, you know, as we go through this process, the neutral stimulus, that tone, gets paired with the food, the unconditioned stimulus. So you learn an association between those two items that will result in salivation. So you pair the NS with the UCS multiple times to condition the dog so that you get to a point where conditioning has taken place. Your neutral sti stimulus is no longer neutral. It's now a conditioned item you respond to. And your UCR, your unconditioned response of salivating, becomes a conditioned response because you never once did that before that neutral stimulus had been paired with the food in this scenario. So some things to remember. An unconditioned stimulus always leads to an unconditioned response. So when you are looking at a breakdown of a scenario where classical conditioning is being implemented, it'd be a great idea to look automatically to see what object seems to cause a natural reaction and what is that natural reaction, because that will help you to differentiate between the UCS and the UCR. Unconditioned simply just means unlearned or untrained. You have not developed an association with that item or object to learn something yet. It's just naturally evocative, okay? Conditioned is the complete opposite. Conditioning means you have learned and trained yourself to respond to it. So it's the same exact thing that you guys undergo if you are athletes. If you're going through football conditioning, soccer conditioning, basketball conditioning, volleyball conditioning, track or cross country conditioning, you are building up your body. You are training it and causing it to learn how to respond to a certain amount of physical stress on your body as you're carrying out whatever sport happens to be. During conditioning, a previously neutral stimulus is transformed into the conditioned stimulus. So the NS becomes the CS. You become conditioned to respond to it. And the unconditioned response will always be the conditioned response because the UCR is always going to happen with the UCS. And since an NS is being paired with that, 
it's going to have the same kind of reaction eventually over time. The only thing that's changing where reactions are concerned is what you are reacting to. You react to the NS, which becomes that CS, rather than the UCS. Stimulus, as I said, is just a thing or an object. Response is just reaction. So it's very important that you keep these two in mind in particular when it comes to writing about these concepts. In your FRQ for this unit, you will be asked, obviously, to address, you know, parts of learning. So it's not enough to write out the word learning. It's not enough to write out stimulus or response. You have to be able to explain what those concepts mean in words that are not identical to the phrases themselves. It's not enough for you to simply just say a UCR is an unconditioned response. What you need to say is a UCR is a reaction that one naturally has to an object. Okay? So that's that. Let's do another real life example of this because I know that it's really difficult to get all of these different alphabet soup terminologies differentiated. There's the UCS, the UCR, the NS, the CS, the, U the CR, all those other kinds of things. So let's do this a little bit in another kind of example, okay? Every time someone flushes a toilet in your house, the shower is going to become very hot and then causes the person to jump back. This is going to be really common for those of you that end up living in the dorms in college, especially if your dorms are older. Look out. Uh, this was a wonderful rite of passage living in the freshman dorms in my experiences because you just prayed that when you were in that shower nobody was going to come in because if they flushed the toilet you were going to be stuck for a good two and a half minutes waiting for that water to cool down. Within this scenario, you have an unconditioned stimulus, an unconditioned response, and a neutral stimulus that requires no... So in this situation, you have an unconditioned stimulus that leads to an unconditioned response. You also have a neutral stimulus that has no response. However, when you pair the NS with the UCS over time, you're still getting the unconditioned response. And so eventually what happens is learning occurs and the conditioned stimulus automatically evokes a conditioned response. So let's look at how this breaks down. Your unconditioned stimulus in this scenario is the hot water because it requires or it kind of facilitates a reaction from you that is natural to jump back out of the hot water. That's going to be an instantaneous kind of reaction. You didn't learn to do that. That's just, ooh, ow, that hurts. Back up. The neutral stimulus is the toilet flush. You never would have jumped back before that point if it hadn't been paired with that hot water. So it evokes no level of response from you initially. But when the toilet flush is paired with that hot water, you get your unconditioned response of jumping back. So eventually, over time, the toilet flush automatically becomes your conditioned stimulus. And your conditioned response is to jump back anytime you hear that action. 